Hi folks, 304 stainless. It's a material that has a notorious reputation for being difficult to machine or rather easy to destroy end mills with. Let's walk through some speeds and feeds for both external features as well as some internal pockets and drilling. Welcome to another Wednesday widget. In Wednesday Widget 164, we covered speeds and feeds for aluminum and regular or mild steel. Both of those materials, they're relatively forgiving. They're relatively free machining. There's a wider range of speeds and feeds that will work, and they're not too particular about what type of end mill or tool that you use. 304 stainless, or many of the stainless series, are the exact opposite you've got a more narrow range of speeds and feeds, the material is less forgiving or it can work harden on you, and you've gotta be much more conscious of the tools that you use. We're using, in fact, a completely different end mill when we're doing outside features versus the tool that we use when we've gotta interpolate in to an inside pocket. And a shout out to Tyson Lamb, Tyson's got a great Instagram page where he makes a lot of golf-related uh, accessories, as well as lambcrafted.com, where he makes some incredible uh, putters and ball markers and uh, golf donuts and divot tool repairs. Really cool stuff. And Tyson has become really good at machining stainless. So, so he was really helpful in some of the tips and tricks. And I want to show you guys, it's not that hard. We can totally do this. We're using this five-flute end mill from Lakeshore. Let's show the speeds and feeds and the cuts, and then we'll come back afterwards and we'll talk about the tools that we're using, why we're using them, and some of the additional details. First, we'll start with the outside profile. We'll do a 2D adaptive first. 200 surface feet per minute, two thousandths of an inch feed per tooth. That's about 0 0.05 millimeters, 0 0.05 inch. That's about 1.3 millimeters or 20% of the tool diameter optimal load. We're leaving 20 thousandths of an inch or about half a millimeter as well. One of the big differences with this 2D adaptive plus 2D contour recipe is in the 2D adaptive, I normally don't leave as much radial stock to leave, but I want to leave enough here so that the tool can dig underneath the 304 skin, which can often work hard in, and is something where you're just not gonna be able to take, just like we talked about in Wednesday Widget 164, you can't take little one thou whisper cuts on stainless, it uh, will devastate your tools quite quickly. And finally, a 2D contour. Same recipe on the cleanup, 200 surface feet, two thou per tooth. I'm staying one thou off of the floor, just to avoid rubbing along that floor. Switching over to internal pockets, so totally different strategy. And what's interesting to me is we're going actually against the recommendation of even Lakeshore here. And I say that only because that's one of the things when you get into these materials is you have to figure out what simply works for you. So I want to do two things. I want to give you guys a starting recipe just to run with, but also the kind of confidence to start thinking about this on your own. So we're using a four flute regular variable flute end mill. So that's not their stainless style, and it's four flutes instead of five flutes. Again, we'll come back to more about that in a minute. 225 surface feet, only one thousandth of an inch per tooth. A reduced optimal load, in this case, is only 10% of the tool diameter, or 0 0.025. Max roughing step down of 0.15 inches, 15 thou radial stock to leave, and max two degree helix.
Let's take a look under a microscope at these chips. We've got an aluminum chip, a mild steel chip, and then the 304 stainless chip. If you take a look at the aluminum chip, you can see how the material appears to be almost like it's slightly torn. It doesn't have that really crisp cut. We look at the mild steel, it does have pretty clean shear lines. And then if we go to the stainless chip, it appears to have similarities back to that aluminum where it's slightly gummy. There's a slight amount of, it just doesn't want to shear as cleanly as that mild steel. Now let's drill 304 stainless. First off, we need to spot drill it. 75 or so surface feet per minute. We're going 3 thou per revolution. And we're going down negative 30 thou. This is really important because this is going to be what sort of breaks through that hardened skin of the stainless steel and presents a better non-worked hardened surface for our drill to do its job. Then we're drilling 3 16 drill. It's cobalt. We'll come back to that in a second. 45 surface feet per minute, 3 thou per rev. Really important. We're taking pretty big peck depths, bigger than I would normally go. In this case, just shy of one times diameter. So it's a 0.1875 drill, about 4.7 millimeters, and we're pecking about that same amount. Worked great, which gets me really, really excited. And I really, again, appreciate Tyson. He was spot on. And here was his advice. Cobalt is the way to go for drilling 304. It's great because it's actually pretty darn inexpensive. The drill bit we just used is from McMaster for $3.67. That's very inexpensive for, it, uh, for what the task is at hand. 45 service feet per minute, 3 thou per revolution. We just mentioned that. Full or big peck depths, that's what's really important here. If you take small pecks, what you're possibly doing is exposing the drill to more of a work hardened surface. Here's the other funny thing. DeWalt or Cobalt type drills from Lowe's or Home Depot can work as well. For example, this guy off Amazon, 20 bucks, but for a pack of 12. 135 degree tip is what you want. Stay away from the drills that have this sort of branded thing. They think they call it pilot point. You don't want to use those. So that's the good news. You can probably even find these drills locally. We've never bought a drill for another reason at, uh, in this for the CNC shop at a Home Depot or a Lowe's. However, you are going to need a spot drill to center drill it that has equal or bigger angle. And I actually didn't have one of those laying around the shop. So we went on to McMaster and purchased this, link in the video description, 140 degree carbide spotting drill. Should last a pretty darn long time. Another important tip is make sure your first peck isn't a shallow peck. What do I mean by that? If we take a look at a wireframe view we're coming in and we're spot drilling down to that depth. And then we are doing our peck 0.16 inch deep. But if you look at my heights tab, the top height is the whole top and the feed height, meaning where do we start drilling? We don't start drilling at the top of the hole. We have to start drilling or transitioning from this yellow rapid move to a green drill move. In this case, I set it at 20 thou above the top height, top height being the top hole. So if we watch a simulation, Peck, 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 back up. So see that first peck was deep. A bad example would be if in our heights tab, we had done something like change the top height to have a 0.1 inch offset. We're gonna peck in 0.16 depths, but we're raising the top of our hole this way. So what can happen is that first peck doesn't go very deep or deep at all, and that can instantly fry a drill. A couple final tips. If you're going smaller than one eighth of an inch, don't use cobalt, but rather use carbide. The good news is the carbide drills are less expensive in those smaller diameters. And then just be careful with really thin sheet stainless or sheet because you've got a skin on both the top and the bottom. Thin stuff is more skin relative to the overall thickness. So it's actually more difficult to drill. And so you may be better off interpolating it. Quick re recap. We've got two different quarter inch end mills. The five flute for stainless, we recommend for outside profiling or cleaning up. Don't ramp in with it. Here's the link and here are the basic speeds and feeds. And we have the four flute quarter inch. 
This, even though it's not technically meant for stainless, we've had great luck with it as has Tyson. Use it for internal pockets or when you've got to ramp into something and here are your starting fees and speeds. So let's talk a little bit more about these two tools and what's interesting. So when I go to lakeshore.com and I click on carbide end mills, I've got variable four flute for tool steel and I've got variable five flute for stainless and mild. So what's the difference between these two? Well, the most obvious difference is this is four flutes and this is five flutes, but these tools are actually very different. And that the biggest difference is this four flute has a more of a honed edge. So it has a more blunt edge. What that means is it's a stronger edge because it's actually honed over. But what that also means is you generally need to increase your chip load per tooth. Remember again, back to the speeds and feeds in widget 164, this inch per tooth. Because it's a honed edge or has less sharpness, we need to increase that inch per tooth. So as it engages that material, that more honed edge is still able to dig underneath and not rub. The variable five flute for stainless has a much sharper edge, which is really good for stainless steel because believe it or not, stainless steel is kind of like aluminum. It's actually a gummy material. It doesn't really like to be cut. So you need to use a sharper edge to shear it. So we use that five flute for these external features. We found this to be really reliable and really great. The problem with the five flute is it doesn't like to ramp. That's the red helical lead into a blind pocket. And the biggest reason it doesn't like to do that is only one of those five flutes actually goes all the way to the center of the face. So in some respects, you're only cutting with one flute as you're doing an interpolation, and there's very little gash clearance, uh, which is the ability on the face of that tool to evacuate or cut the chip. So you could adjust the helical ramp diameter to try to work around that, but the better answer, and again, shout out to Tyson for the help here, is just use the four flutes. Yes, it's technically in the title not meant for stainless, in the description it includes stainless steels. And I'll admit, as a layman, this sometimes is frustrating, but as you get into these more exotic materials, you've got to use recipes that your tooling supplier or people who have done this before work, and if it works, awesome. Some other tips and tricks. When you do a helical ramp in, never use more than two degree ramp in. Again, we recommend, and Tyson recommended, using the four flute instead of the five flute. Don't go greater than a 3 sixteenths inch or about 4.7 millimeter depth of cut. I reduced this one to 0.15 because it's a 0.3 uh, deep pocket. So just taking it half at a time. You absolutely need an air blast to help evacuate the chip. The number one cause of end mill failure in stainless is recutting your chips. You also need coolant for the lubricity to help avoid the chips sticking to the end mill. So that's why I like the fog buster here uh, with the air pressure and some of the quality chem mixed into it. Flood coolant, it would work as long as it's high enough pressure to really evacuate those chips. Start off with a reduced optimal load. Here we're doing 10%. You can increase that, but start with something that works and then start increasing your way up and experimenting. Again, ramp with a four flute. Once you're ramped in, you can go ahead and finish with a five flute because again, once you've done that helical interpolation, the fact that it's an inside pocket is no different really than the outside pocket. Tools that have a small corner radius, in this case, it may only be 10, 15, 20 thousandths of an inch can really help increase your tool life because the very tip of that flute is the weakest part. So by getting rid of that weakest part, by adding a radius, you're really helping extend your tool life. And, and avoid shallow pockets. Because stainless steel uh, has a work hardened scale when you purchase it, if you try to take say a 10 or 15 thou or very small uh, pocket, you're just gonna be working in all work hardened material. So if you have to do that, you're better off decking it off first. And so long as you have good feeds and speeds when you do that, you shouldn't rework harden that surface. At least that's my understanding. We're gonna do some more experimenting because quite frankly, this is pretty fun and it's good to push myself. We tried machining three or four years back and we failed so quickly that I gave up. You know, it's intimidating. I think it's something where I'm hoping giving you guys the right recipe, the right speeds and feeds, the right tooling, we can all be cutting 304. Folks, hope you learned something, hope you enjoyed. Take care, see you next Wednesday.